In this video, I'm gonna try to beat Pokemon Violet, but instead of getting to choose the Pokemon that I use, I'll only be allowed to use the random Pokemon that I get back from Surprise Trade. If you don't know, Surprise Trade is a feature that lets you randomly trade Pokemon with someone from the internet. Sometimes the results can be amazing, but most of the time it goes a little something like this. Better be something good. Ugh. The game begins as we meet the director of our new school and the nerd from down the street, Nimona. Hey. Uh, hi. You wanna be friends? To be honest, no. You're gonna regret that. We try our best to ignore Nimona's mouth breathing as we choose our starter Pokemon. Since we'll be surprised trading this thing away anyway, we make our decision based solely off of the quality of their haircut. It's perfect. With our new starter, we begin making our way to school to start our academic journey. Along the way, we catch a prize pig, which comes in handy as we arrive at the first Pokemon Center. This is the point in the game where you finally get access to the Poke Portal and Surprise Trade. We connect to the internet, then make our first two sacrifices to the Surprise Trade gods. Hopefully they, they hook us up with something good. A Mudsdale, it's gonna be way too high level though. Two seconds later. Oh. <laughs> These Two trades are absolutely tragic. As if beating the game using random Pokemon from the internet wasn't already hard enough, to make this challenge even harder, we also added a bunch of other rules that we'll have to follow as we play through. The first of these rules is that we're playing the game with level caps. This means that we can't use any Pokemon that's a higher level than the highest level Pokemon in the next gym. So this Mudsdale may seem great, especially early on, but it's level 34, which means that we won't be able to use it until after the fourth gym. So it looks like Surskit is gonna have to fly solo. You may be wondering, why don't we just trade for another Pokemon? Well, that's because of our second rule, which makes it so we'll only be able to trade for an additional Pokemon after we defeat a gym leader. Since we can't use Mudsdale because of the level cap, and we can't get any new Pokemon until we defeat a gym leader, our unassuming little friend Surskit has to carry us all the way to our first gym badge. This little bug has a lot riding on its shoulders, which is pretty bad for us because if you couldn't tell by looking at it, this little guy is not very strong. Luckily, I've got a few tricks up my sleeve. Normally, at this point in the game, you're forced to go into Mesagoza and go to school, but there just so happens to be a way that you can skip going into town. If you head up to this ledge here and target a Pokemon on the other side, you can hit them with a Pokeball and initiate a battle. If you do this correctly, your character will be teleported across this gap and out of the starting zone. Since this game is open world, once you're out of the starting zone, you can go pretty much anywhere you want. We aren't able to progress the story while we're out here, but what we can do is grab some helpful items and TMs, namely the TM for Mudshot, which we teach the Surskit in preparation for our next battle. After our little excursion, we fly back to Los Platos, then continue on our way to school. We make our way up to the gates of Mesagoza. Wait, what's that sound? Oh God, it's her. Let's battle. Uh. Okay. Before we get into this battle, I want to explain another rule. For this challenge, we're playing with permadeath, which means that if any of our Pokemon ever faint, we won't be allowed to use them ever again. And if all of our Pokemon faint, we instantly lose the challenge. Now that you know what's truly at stake here, let's get into the battle. We lead with our hero Surskit against Demonis Coco. Luckily, we're able to one-shot our croc with a bubble beam, then she brings in her second Pokemon, Palmy. This little guy may seem cute, but it turns out this thing is an electric type, which hits our water type Surskit super effectively. Not only that, but in this battle, Nimona terrestrializes this little guy, which boosts the power of this thing's electric attacks and makes it even more dangerous. This Palmy is the reason why we went through all that trouble to get the Mudshot TM earlier. We fire off a super effective Mudshot on turn one, but her Palmy just barely survives. We brace ourselves for impact as it fires back with a boosted Thundershock. Whew, that was a close one. After surviving Nimona's attack, we're able to finish out the fight with a bubble beam, then try to put as much distance between us and Nimona as possible as we head into school. Hey there, classmate. No. No. No! In school, we learn about the three major storylines of this game. The first storyline is Victory Road, which is your standard Pokemon quest where you battle through the eight gyms, then face the Elite Four, and ultimately battle the champion. The second storyline is Starfall Street, where you team up with the mysterious hacker Cassiopeia to find and defeat the five leaders of the evil Team Star. And the last storyline is the Path of Legends, where you team up with your stoner classmate Arvin in a goofy adventure to track down and defeat the region's five Titan Pokemon in order to gather as much herb as possible. 
That sounds more like the plot of a Harold and Kumar movie than a Pokemon game, but I'm not complaining. In order to fully beat the game, we need to complete all three storylines. With no time to waste, we get to work on our first objective. We head east to Mesagoza to the home of the first gym and its leader, Katie. We find our way into town, but before we're able to duke it out with the baddie baker herself, first we have to overcome the gym challenge, the olive roll. Mom, after olive rolling our way through to another championship, we prepare our little Surskit as much as possible, then head into battle. Katie leads with a nimble against our Surskit. Surskit trades a couple bubble beams for struggle bugs until we finish this grasshopper off. The problem here is that in addition to doing damage, the move struggle bug also drops our special attack. With our special attack lowered, we aren't able to do enough damage to our next Pokemon Tarantula to defeat it before it defeats us. No. <laughs> That was just a warm up, okay? Since we lost so early and not much happens in the beginning of this game, I decided to save an hour of my life by not resetting all the way to the beginning. Instead, we kick off our second attempt by simply surprise trading for two new Pokemon. Wingle, Wingle's great. Oh, Wingle's so good for this gym. Bamf is okay. At least it's Meows. Luckily, we get to start off attempt two with two Pokemon we can actually use. And we even have a flying type Wingull to counter Katie's bugs. Before the battle, we teach me out the flying type move Aerial Ace, which should definitely come in handy. With our new team prepped, we head in to give this gym another go. Meowth does its best bird impression and takes out her lead Nimble with a super effective Aerial Ace. Then Katie brings in her Tarantula, who miraculously lives through our attack and takes out our Meowth. <gasps> Look, I thought bug types were supposed to be weak. I have no idea what is going on here. Down a Pokemon, but still alive, we bring in Wingull, then fire off a water gun. That doesn't kill? What is happening? Because it doesn't die, we take some unfortunate damage before we're able to finish it off. Finally, we face off against our last Pokemon, Teddy Ursa. This little bear comes in and terrestrializes, so we do the same. It outspeeds us, then hits us with a Terra Boosted Fury Cutter. Oh. What we neglected to consider is that by terrestrializing, our Wingull loses its flying type and becomes a pure water type, which takes away our resistance to bug and is probably why we died here. All right, attempt number three. Okay. I guess. What is going on? Well, both of these Pokemon are overleveled. All right. One time, one time, one time. Okay, it's not good for this gym, but it's good in general. Iggly buff. Uh... All right, Sprigatito is obviously insane once it's fully evolved, but the real star here is Igglybuff. For the early game, Igglybuff is one of the best Pokemon we can get because it's a friendship evolution, which means that we can evolve it into a Jigglypuff without having to level it up. Jigglypuff is okay on its own, but you know what's even better than Jigglypuff? That's right, a big Jigglypuff. By using a Moonstone on our Puffball, we can instantly evolve it into its final form, Wigglytuff. I feel like this goes without saying, but having a third evolution Pokemon to face the first gym is kind of busted. On evolution, Wigglytuff gets access to a whole host of the most powerful moves in the game, like Play Rough and Hyper Voice. The strength of Hyper Voice alone is more than enough for us to easily cruise through Katie's first two Pokemon. Her Teddy Ursa does manage to live through one hit, but it's no big deal. We clean it up on the next turn and secure our first gym badge. I could safely say that this was the first time in the dozens of Nuzlocks that I've done that I've had to reset five times to beat the first gym. Oh, also I had COVID while I was recording this, so you should feel sorry for me and subscribe. Bye. Now that we've conquered our first challenge, we earn the ability to surprise trade for an additional Pokemon. Ralts? Ooh. Ooh. A male Ralts is a huge win in my book because once it gets to level 20 and evolves into Kirlia, we can use a Dawnstone to instantly evolve it into its final form, Galate. But that'll have to wait because the level cap is still a bit too low for us to get there. We follow the scent of money through the canyons east of Mesagoza until we find the first Titan. Money! Sprigatito and Ralts are still too small and adorable to risk being used in this fight, so Wigglytuff loads the team in its backpack for another battle. We use a couple charms to drop this crab's attack until 
while there's not much it can do other than stand there and look really angry. Meaning we get an easy win over our king-sized enemy with a couple Terra boosted play roughs. The Titan runs for its life, but after our experience in the first gym, I'm not feeling very merciful, so we pounce on it from above, then team up with Arvin and swiftly dispatch our foe. After harvesting the precious Herba Mystica, we boost our way over to the town of Artisan, then head in to face the second gym. You left some dirty underwear in your dorm room. Uh, thanks. Okay, bye. <laughs> After collecting ourselves, we head into the gym challenge, which has us rounding up all the missing flowers from the town's flower corral. After returning the sun flora safe and sound, we face off against the next gym leader, Brassius. For this fight, we decide to play it super safe, giving Wigglytuff the move Stockpile and Swallow. When used, Stockpile boosts your Pokemon's defenses. After using Stockpile, you're able to use Swallow to heal various amounts of HP, depending on how big of a load your Pokemon has stored up. The bigger your Pokemon's load is, the more you'll heal when you Swallow. Ugh, grow up. All this setup was probably unnecessary, but in hindsight, I'm glad I played these early fights super safe because boy, do things get crazy later on. Despite a couple annoying crits from Brassius' Razor Leafs, our plan pretty much goes off without too much issue. We're able to keep swallowing to keep our HP high while using Hyper Voice to defeat Brassius' three Pokemon. After securing our second gym badge, it's time to add another Pokemon to the squad. Aracuda, I've never used one of these, but I think that... I think they're all right. They're pretty strong, they're pretty fast. Aracuda may be relatively weak now, but once this fish evolves into Barascuda, it can dish out some serious damage. The next stop on our world tour takes us all the way over to the other side of the map to this mountain. Here we find the Titan Pokemon Bombardier. We navigate our way through this bird's seemingly infinite supply of gigantic rolling boulders as we climb up to face it. I mean, really, where's it getting all these rocks? Thanks to the fact that it's part dark type, which is something that I definitely knew before this fight. Oh, it's part dark type. We're able to load the team into Wigglytuff's backpack and use Terra boosted play roughs to beat it up until it shrinks away into nothingness. After a celebratory cavern picnic, we move on to battle our next opponent, the team star leader Giacomo. His highest level Pokemon is level 21, which means that we're able to level up Ralts until it evolves into a Kirlia, then immediately use a Dawnstone on it to evolve it into a Galley. Stronger than ever, we head into the base and have our Pokemon mow down his henchmen until eventually Big G has no choice but to come out and face us in battle. Turns out that on evolution, Gallade gets access to the absurdly powerful fighting type move Sacred Sword, which hits Giacomo's dark types super effectively. Yeah, this was a pretty quick one. After dishing out a healthy helping of justice, we follow the searchlights on the horizon over to the bustling metropolis of Lavincia, which is the home of the next gym leader Iono. But as we're heading in to face her, we hear the familiar sound of labored breathing as we're ambushed by our stalker Nimona and forced into a battle. At some point along our journey, our tiny cute kitty Sprigatito transformed into a furry icon. Not sure how that happened, but what my Pokemon do in their free time is really none of my business. Spriggy crushes Demona's rock ruff with a seed bomb, and you could say <laughs> Spriggy really walks the dog here. <laughs> Her Rockruff and Palmy fall to our furry excellence, and we swap to Gallade as she brings in her ace Crocolore. It seems that one funny hat wasn't quite enough for this croc, as it comes in and proceeds to put on a second, even funnier hat by terastalizing. It manages to live through a super effective Aqua Cutter, but we're easily able to clean it up on the next turn. After the battle, we step into the Iono Zone and instantly become an internet sensation. Without thinking, we rushed right into this gym challenge, which turns out to be a critical error. Oh, I have to battle? Oh, we might get overleveled. Oh no. Wait, that's actually terrible. Yeah, I, I forgot that there were battles in this challenge. Despite our best efforts, we end up overleveling Spriggy, meaning that we can't use it in our fight against Iono. This is extremely unfortunate because for some reason, they decided to give Iono four Pokemon, which is a bigger team than both of the next two gym leaders. Not only that, but her Ace Miss Magus is an absolute beast. But there's nothing we can do now other than head into the fight and face our destiny. Her Watrell falls easily to a single Night Slash from Gallade, then she brings in her Belly Bolt. We slap this thing with a sacred sword that doesn't quite kill. This activates Belly Bolt's ability, Electromorphosis, which charges up its next electric attack. Oh, it does so much damage. That was certainly more damage than we would like to take on our best Pokemon. Ugh. 
We finish this frog off on the next turn and easily smack down her Luxio, but then Iono sends in her trump card, Miss Magus. Since our Gallade is low on HP and its attack was dropped by Luxio's ability Intimidate, leaving it in the battle makes me too nervous, especially because Miss Magus has access to the super effective ghost type attack Hex. So we take this opportunity to swap in Wigglytuff, Terastalize, and hope for the best. Who's Ray? Ugh! Don't hit yourself. Oh my goodness, come on, Wigglytuff. At least it didn't do that much damage. Oh, if we hit ourselves again, we're so screwed. Okay, okay. We just need to get through confusion this time, and then we're very safe. Oh, it does so much damage. Okay, we snapped out. Beautiful, don't miss. Nice, yes! Okay, perfect. Perfect. After barely winning that fight, we turn our back on our potential career as an influencer and head out to put Lavincia behind us, hopefully for good. As we're exiting the gym, we notice this strange set of elevators in the lobby. We aren't able to access them, but they do seem very suspicious. Something about this whole thing doesn't add up. How does Nimona keep finding us? Why are there locked elevators in public gym buildings? Why are Iono's teeth so pointy? And who is Clive? It just doesn't make sense. Eh, whatever. It's time for another surprise trade. Ooh, that's that's pretty cool. It hopefully it's not over leveled, but I haven't gotten to use one of these yet. Oh, Rev Room is cool. While we won't get to use it for a while, thanks to the fact that it's level 40, I am very excited to get to use Rev of Room for the first time. Now that we've cleared Iono's gym, our next objective is to dismantle another Team Star hideout. Before we get to that though, we train up our team a bit, evolving Eren the Aracuda into its bigger, meaner form. This evolution couldn't have come at a more perfect time because the next Team Star leader is Mela, who specializes in fire types. Our new buddy Charlos leads the charge as we head in to quench Mela's flames. We solo her entire base with three Pokemon on, then Mela has no choice but to face us. Somehow as we were battling an entire army, the order of our team got messed up, so we end up with Gallade out first and have to waste a turn swapping to Wigglytuff. Once Wigglytuff is in, we use the move Rain Dance that we taught it before the battle to cancel out the sun set up by our Torkoal. This weakens the power of Mela's fire attack, allowing us to safely swap in our fish and dive our way to victory. Oh, hey, Arvin, what's crack a lacking? Hey, Daddy Q, you want to go kill another big innocent animal? Yeah, more than anything. We head into the high desert above Lavincia, then track down the next Titan, Orthworm. Oh, he looks like such a nice guy. Nice or not, Gallade sacredly slaps the piss out of this big worm, then we eat its precious plant and make our way out to the next gym in Cascarafa. Here, we're forced to run a bunch of errands for the gym leader, Mr. Goofy. After retiring from our days as a task rabbit, we head into battle to duke it out with Kofu's water types. To start the battle off, we have a good old fashioned fish face off against his Veluza. Barascuda is able to use a few bites to come out on top, then he swaps to Wugtrio, who gets diced into Calamari by our Gallade's Leaf Blade. Finally, he brings in his Ace Crabominable, and we swap to Spriggy. We fire off a Terra Boosted Seed Bomb, which is somehow not quite enough to take out this beefy boy. That's a lot of damage. Spriggy holds on through a slam and takes the fight home on the next turn. After the gym, we're able to welcome another team member from the internet. This Charmander is a huge addition to the team, bringing coverage for fire and flying, which are both great offensive types. After the trade, we head out into the Great Desert. We use Maridon's backwards jump to avoid slipping off the cliff as we climb our way up this mountain and grab the TM for drill run. Then we battle five trainers and talk to the league rep in Cascarafa to get the TM for Earthquake. These TMs could not have come at a better time. Our Switch hardware trembles in fear as we ride into the place where no no playtester dare set foot. The tag tree thick. The sound of our console's tiny fans are deafening as we approach the most challenging battle we've seen so far. Relative to his level, the Team Star leader Atticus might be the hardest fight in the entire game. He specializes in poison types, so before the battle, we teach Earthquake to Gallade and Drill Run to Barascuda. This gives us a couple super effective options against poison, but other than those two moves, our team matches up pretty poorly against this guy. We prepare as much as we possibly 
can then head into the battle. Atticus leads with Skunk Tank against our Barrascuta. This skunk has both Sucker Punch and Toxic, both of which are pretty disastrous if they land. Without much choice, we go for a drill run turn one and get a Sucker Punch right to the dome. To make matters worse, Skunk Tank lives through the drill run, putting us at risk to take even more damage from another Sucker Punch on the next turn. If this skunk hits us with another Sucker Punch, our run could just be over. Luckily, it doesn't go for another punch, so we're able to finish it off without taking any more damage. Next, Atticus sends in his muck. We know that Barrascuta probably won't be able to one-shot this thing with Drill Run, but there is a chance that our fish could survive one attack. So we stay in and fire off another Drill Run. Oh, is that a crit? Oh, that's, that's huge. Wait, that's insane. That crit brings us back to a relatively even position as Atticus sends in his Revivroom, which gets outsped by our fish and falls to a four times effective drill run. Finally, he brings in his bigger, badder Revivroom. We hit it with a drill run turn one, then get super lucky as it goes for a flame charge, which we resist. This attack does boost its speed, but not quite enough to outspeed our fish. So it goes for another flame charge on the next turn, and we build up even more damage with another drill run. After that second flame charge, this car is is now faster than Barrascuta. <sighs> Rip. I didn't have the heart to tell you before, but going into this fight, I knew that we would probably lose at least one Pokemon. Knowing still doesn't make it hurt any less. But there's no time to be sad because our work here is far from over. Not only is this Revivroom super fast, but as we've been hitting it, its ability Toxic Debris has covered the battlefield with Toxic Spikes. These spikes cause our Gallade to get poisoned as we switch in. The first turn, Gallade takes a noxious torque to the face, then we fire back with an Earthquake. After taking the damage from Poison at the end of our turn, there's a good chance that Gallade won't survive another hit. If Gallag goes down, we have basically nothing that will be able to stop this Revivroom from tearing through our entire team. We live through this. Please live on like one. Yes. <laughs> yes. That was way too close. After collecting ourselves, we put the laggy hellscape that is this forest behind us for good as we make our way through the Dalazapa Passage into the town of Medali where we find the next gym. Along the way, we're able to level Spriggy and Charmeleon up enough to evolve into their final forms. Now that our two starters are fully juiced up, we head into the gym building where... I wanted to give you something. It's a bundle of your hair. It's been falling out. Please, just leave. We make sure that the coast is clear, then begin the gym challenge. This challenge has us trying to decipher the secret menu in the town's restaurant with the clues that are hidden around town. Somehow, with no prior knowledge of this game whatsoever, we're able to take a wild guess and bink the secret menu item first try. This lets us interrupt the gym leader Larry's government-mandated 30-minute lunch break and force him into a battle. As we were training up for this gym, our Gallade learned the move Swords Dance, which we use turn one to boost our attack as Larry's Kamala hits us with a yawn. We one-shot this koala with a boosted sacred sword, but at the end of the turn, our Gallade falls asleep. Obviously, we're prepared to counter such an elementary move. Our Gallade eats the Chesto Berry we gave it before battle and wakes up to one-shot Larry's Dudunsparce. Finally, he brings in his Aceraptor. I'm thinking we live with like a third HP. That did so much more damage than I was expecting it to. Oh, <laughs> wow. Good thing that didn't crit, I guess. That was crazy. If that was Brave Bird or anything like that, we would have been completely cooked. Was never worried, not even for a second. Which is a good thing because Nimona doesn't give us any time to collect ourselves before forcing us into a battle right after the gym. At this point, Nimona's team is starting to become even scarier than her behavior. Her Pokemon are growing into their final evolutions, but she's still not quite strong enough to avoid getting swept by Gallade. <sighs> Smell you later. Another gym badge means another surprise trade. Ugh. I don't know anything about this Pokemon. You know, at first I was really bummed to get this little bug, but then I evolved it and gave it a chance. Oh! Almost kills. Dang, this thing kinda is a hitter, huh? Turns out this little grasshopper is a lean, mean slicing machine. Plus its name in whatever language this is, is so badass. Extremo. 
Our next objective is the sixth gym, which ups the level cap to level 42, meaning that in addition to our new grasshopper, we can finally add Rev of Room to our squad. We make our way up the snowy slopes of Glaciado Mountain to the village of Montanavera. Here we find the next gym. We begin the gym challenge, which has us taking over as the warm up act for the gym leader, Rhyme. W battle? I may have misread this situation. We bury that feeling of embarrassment deep down where we'll never ever have to deal with it as we fight through the double battles of this gym challenge. After getting the crowd super hot with our battling skills, we face off against the gym leader, Rhyme. We lead with our Grasshopper and Charizard against Rhyme's Mimikyu and Binet. Turn one, Charizard immediately gets a sucker punch to the face from Binet, but we retaliate with big damage from a flamethrower. Then we break Mimikyu's disguise with a throat chop as Charizard takes even more damage from Mimikyu's slash. At this point, our Charizard is a little low on HP, but Lokix should be able to use Sucker Punch to finish off this Binet before that's a problem, so we decide not to switch it out. One thing we neglected to think about is the fact that if both you and your opponent use Sucker Punch on the same turn, only one of you actually gets to attack, and that's determined by which Pokemon is faster. At least that's how I thought it worked. Lokix is definitely faster than Binet, but for some reason, Binet's Sucker Punch goes through while ours fails. If you know why this happened, please let me know in the comments I am so genuinely confused. This sucker punch isn't quite enough to finish off our Charizard. No, that honor belongs to our good friend Mimikyu. Oh, what am I doing? Charlie! It's still kind of hard for me to watch this because it was such a costly misplay that could have easily been prevented. After Charizard goes down, we bring in Spriggy and immediately Terastalize. We finish off the Binet with a Throat Chop, then take out the Mimikyu with the Flower Trick. Now Rhyme is down to her last two Pokemon. As we go into the next turn, we learn that there is one thing that this Matadavera crowd loves more than anything else. And that thing is a good old fashioned Terastalization. Since we were the first person to Terastalize in this battle, the crowd lends us their strength with a boost to all of our Pokemon stats. We're able to use these boosted stats to one-shot Rhyme's Houndstone with a Sucker Punch, then easily finish off her Ace Toxtricity with a couple Flower Tricks. While we may have lost our sweet Charizard, beating this gym lets us instantly fill the void it left in our heart with a rebound surprise trick. Ooh, great. That's so, that came in, that's actually so clutch because it came right as we lost Charizard. Pyro is actually insane. That's right, we lose one fire type, then instantly pick up another better fire type? That's not cope, what? Cope or nope, our luck with the trades in this run has been pretty insane so far. At this point in the game, the next Titan and the next gym leader are both at the same level. That means to avoid overleveling our Pokemon, we'll have to fight one of them slightly under the level cap. Since the Titan is just one Pokemon that you get to double team with Arvin, we decide to take it on before heading to the next gym. We track this big steel boy out to the middle of the desert where it proceeds to break our ankles more times than I care to admit. Finally, we're able to pin the beast down, then oh my god, Larry, you torched that thing. We chase this elephant down as it runs for its life, then team up with Arvin to defeat it for a second time. Unfortunately, this second fight isn't quite as straightforward as the last one. This time, it takes us two flamethrowers to take it out. With the titan out of the way, we head into its cave. Well, won't be needing this anymore. <laughs> After eating this herb, Maridon remembers that it has extendable wings in the side of its head. Wow, those definitely could have come in handy earlier. We leave the desert and make our way to our next objective, the seventh gym in the town of Alfernada. <sighs> oh, funny seeing you here. <sighs> This encounter with Nimona was something that I was thoroughly not prepared for. If you've ever done a Nuzlocke before, you'll know that tragedy always strikes when you're least expecting it. Her Lycanroc goes down to a Flower Trick from Spriggy easily enough, then we make the critical mistake of trying to use Flower Trick on her Sligu, whose ability Sap Sipper makes it immune to grass type attacks. After realizing our mistake, we nope our kitty right out of there, then bring in Iggy and hit this dragon with the play rough. It just barely survives, then, oh, it has Endeavor? Oh, it has Flail. Holy crap, Flail did a lot of damage. Luckily, we're able to clean it up without losing Iggy. Then we swap to Gallade as Nimona brings in her Palma. The dog outspeeds our Gallade and paralyzes it with a Thunder Punch on turn one, but we manage to fight through the paralysis and one-shot it with an Earthquake. Finally, she brings in her Ace Skeledurge, so we swap to Larry. Terrestrializing. Oh, it Terra's into pure fire, doesn't it? Ugh. Oh, that did like no damage. What? Oh no, if it's Torch Song. Oh no. Oh no. Cause it's boosting its special. Oh no. Uh, maybe I hyper beam next turn. Cause we have to get damage on this thing. 
We have to get damage on this thing. Maybe this kills? No, not quite. We're dead to the Torch Song. Ugh. Oh, rip. Ugh. Rip, Larry. Oh, man. This went so poorly. Went so bad. Ugh. Rip, dude. Wow. That sure went poorly. We regrouped from that tragic loss, then head into the gym challenge to exercise out our emotional demons. Hey! I love this. Yeah, I nailed that. Now that we've felt all the feelings that there are to feel, we can finally challenge the gym leader, Tulip. To the untrained eye, it might seem like Tulip is a psychic type trainer, but if you look closer, you'll realize that her team's real theme is sex appeal. Obviously, she's got Gardevoir. You've also got Florges, if you're into that kind of thing. Then his Pathra, don't even get me started on his Pathra. And for Ridgeraff to round it out, Aluga. this is literally a collection of Rule 34 royalty. While Tulip's team is primarily made up of psychic types, most of her Pokemon also have fairy type attacks, so dark type Pokemon aren't quite as good as they otherwise might be. Regardless, we lead with low kicks against their Ferrigiraff and take it out with a couple super effective lunges. Next, she sends in her Gardevoir, so we swap to Spriggy and immediately Terrastalize to turn ourselves into a pure grass type. This transformation prevents us from potentially taking super effective damage from a Dazzling Gleam. In the end, it didn't even matter though, because we instantly one shot this weirdly hot Pokemon with a flower trick. Next, her Espathra comes in and we instantly fire off another flower trick without really thinking much about it. Unfortunately, this bird is able to hang on through our flowery fury with the tiniest sliver of health. Then it claps back with a psychic that wipes out half of our health bar. We do manage to take it out with another flower trick on the following turn, but our cat is in sorry shape as she brings in her ace, Florges. It instantly terrestrializes and we decide to not risk staying in, so we go for a U-turn, which does some decent damage and allows us to swap out to low kicks. We make the switch thinking that Florges is going to take advantage advantage of its psychic boost from terrestrializing, but it used Mood Blast? What? Why would... Oh. Then... It crit? <laughs> oh my... It's been over a week since this happened and I'm I'm still mad about it. Whatever. We finish up the fight with Spriggy and limp out of the gym two Pokemon lighter than when we enter. At this point, we're down to a team of just three Pokemon, so these next couple surprise trades really need to be good. Oh, that's fine. You know, I've never actually used a Cryogonal before, but looking at these stats, it seems like it might be pretty decent. Unfortunately, this Snowflake doesn't help us with our next objective, the final gym in Paldea. This gym's leader, Grusha, specializes in ice types, so we put the Snowflake on the bench as we trudge all the way back up Glaciato Mountain. After setting a world record on the ski slopes, we headed to battle where we lead with Revavroom against Grusha's Frostmoth. We kick off the fight with a shift gear to boost our speed and attack as this bug sets up a tailwind. We get off another shift gear on the next turn, then something strange happens. Okay, I was gonna say, does that mean we're frozen? <laughs> that does mean we're frozen. Yep, that's right, frozen on the first blizzard, just my luck. I really thought this gym was gonna be a gimme, so I didn't prepare a backup plan. So we proceed with plan A, trying to thaw out of the ice while healing up with leftovers. After some pretty decent luck, we finally thaw out, then for some reason we decide to live even more dangerously and go for two more shift gears. Thanks to all that setup, our speed is maxed out and our attack is ridiculously boosted, so we're easily able to one-shot this frost moth with an iron head, then we proceed to do the exact same thing to the last three members of Grusha's team. With the eighth badge secured, we begin our second to last surprise trade. Not great. Not great, but it'll have to do. With all eight gyms complete, we unlock the ability to challenge the Elite Four. But before we challenge the League, we decide to wrap up the main part of the other two storylines, meaning our next objective is the fourth team star base. We head over to dethrone the next criminal kingpin, but before we can do that, we need to get our Diglett into shape. Pro tip, if you ever need a lot of experience, you can head up to these fields, make a ham sandwich to boost your normal encounter power, then almost endlessly grind on chances. Wow. That was a sentence I never thought I'd say. This spot also happens to be right next door to the little Lord Ortega's house. After farming the Chansey Fields, we Kool-Aid man ourselves inside of Ortega's base. Oh yeah! 
thing we have our friend Revavroom because this thing looks like it was designed with a single purpose, destroy any and all fairy types, which is exactly what it's able to do in this battle. After a nice warm up of killing 30 of Ortega's closest friends, the little lord comes out on his noble steed and challenges us to a battle. We take out his lead Azumarill with a poison jab, then he brings in his dock spun and hits us with a mudslide. At this point, we don't have enough Pokemon to be messing around with our accuracy lowered, so after we poison this dog with our poison jab on the same turn, we swap to Cryogonal as the poison damage finishes it off. Then we swap back to Revivroom and max out our attack and speed with shift gear as Ortega brings in his Wigglytuff. With our stats maxed out, we take out his Wigglytuff and face off against Dad? I missed you, son. Why? Oh, dear God. After defeating Ortega, we only have a couple more things to do. We grab our big game hunting buddy Arvin, then head over to the Western Bay in search of the final Titan, the False Dragon. We know that the only thing this Titan loves more than itself are its little buddies, so we start bullying every Tatsugiri in sight until the first round against the Titan goes about as well as you could hope for. We're able to two shot it with flower tricks from Meowskarada. After the battle, it makes off faster than Arvin when Nimona tells him she's home alone. Then we have a high speed chase with this big mouth bass until we arrive at its herb stash. In the second phase, Arvin jumps in and gets a piece, so we're easily able to kick this big fish's teeth in. Aw, look at the little guy. Oh, oh! The true false dragon pushes us to the limit, but in the end, we barely squeak out a W with Spriggy. To celebrate our victory, we have one last dance with Arvin and Mary Jane, then head off to finish what we started in the final Team Star Lair. We lag our way through Ares' goons until we reach the top of her camp and challenge her to a battle. To start the battle off, we send out Revivroom against her Toxicroak. We instantly Terastalize to increase our resistance to fighting attacks and spend the next six turns maxing out our speed and attack with shift gear as this frog tries repeatedly to hit us with a sucker punch that never lands. With our massively boosted attack, we one-shot our team until... Mom? Why? With that win, we've officially completed the main parts of all three storylines and entered the end game. To celebrate, I decide to cut myself some slack and reward my own hard work with the bonus surprise trade. Phineas. Don't be fooled by Fenizen's unassuming appearance. After we team up with our friend on the Union Circle and level it up, it evolves into Palafin. While it may look the exact same, this little dolphin has a big, powerful secret. More on that in a second. As we enter the end of this game, it pretty much exclusively becomes a bunch of battles back to back all around the same level. So at this point, the level caps are gonna soften up. To make up for that, after we enter the Elite Four, we won't be able to grind for XP anymore. At the end of each storyline, there's a set of major battles. To kick things off, we start with the Elite Four, where we definitely do not fail our written exam the first time, then head in to take on the battle assessment. This part of our test puts us up against the four members of the Elite Four, starting with Rika and her ground type Pokemon. Luckily, our team was basically built to destroy ground types. We leave with Spriggy against her Whiskash and take it out with a four times effective flower trick on turn one. Next, Rika brings in her camera up, so we swap to Palafin, then use the move Flip Turn on turn one, which one shots the camera up and allows us to switch our dolphin out. Switching out activates Palafin's ability zero to hero. So when we bring it back in against her Don fan, you might notice that it looks a little bit different. Not only does this transformation make it look super buff, but it also boosts all of its stats and turns this thing from a pretty crappy Pokemon into one of the best in the game. Riga's Dawn fan does live through our liquidation thanks to its ability Sturdy, but that's not too big of an issue as we're able to take it out on the next turn. From here, we outspeed Riga's Dugtrio and take it out, then bring Spriggy back in to deal with her ace Claude Sire with the flower trick. Next into the octagon is, is that a literal child? Yes, my friends, this is the tiny steel specialist, Poppy. We start off with Palafin against her Kaparaja, then flip turn out turn one as this elephant sets up stealth rocks. The next turn, Spriggy's able to take out this heavy boy with the low kick, then we swap to Palafin as she brings in Corviknight. We smack it with the liquidation, which does not do nearly as much damage as we were expecting. And to make matters worse, this bird boosts its defense with an iron defense on the same turn. The next two turns, we tickle this thing with liquidation, as it smacks us around with body press. Eventually, we're able to barely clutch it out, but at this point, Palafin has taken too much damage to stay in, so we swap the Dugtrio as Poppy brings in her Magnezone. We hit this thing with the four times effective Earthquake, then... Oh, it has Sturdy. 
I should have waited and flip turned. That would have been way smarter than this. Our frail boy Doug Trio breathes a sigh of relief as Magnezone sets up a light screen instead of taking its life. We count our blessings as we swap to Spriggy to dispatch her Bronzong with a couple Night Slashes, then bring in Wigglytuff to face off against her ace Tinkaton. You might be thinking, what? A fairy type against a terrastalized steel Pokemon? Are you stupid? To that I say, no, I'm not stupid and that's not very nice. Tinkaton has the signature move Gigaton Hammer, which is an absolutely busted crazy strong move, but it has a drawback. You see, you can't use it two turns in a row. That means we're able to use Protect every other turn to block this thing's Gigaton Hammer as we drop its attack with Charm. Eventually we mess up and get hit, but Wigglytuff barely survives our idiotic misplay. Oh, whoops. That was a misplay. With its attack dropped, we bring in Revivroom to finish out the fight with a few bulldozes. After pummeling Poppy, our next opponent Larry comes into battle while making sure to look as apathetic as possible. The gym leader turned Elite Four member has reinvented himself since our last battle, changing over from normal types to flying types, which is good for us because it allows us to send in Cryogonal, Terastalize, and outspeed his entire team, one-shotting them with Ice Beams. Easy. Next up is the granddaddy of the group, Hassle. He creaks his old bones into the room, then we duke it out with his dragon types. Again, we lead with Cryogonal, but this time we decide to max out our defense with Acid Armor before trying to sweep his team, just in case. We Terrastalize, then make our way through his first four dragons without much issue. Then he brings in his ace, the pseudo-legendary Baxcalibur. We hit it with an Ice Beam, but it doesn't quite kill. Thankfully, our boosted defense allows us to live through its super powerful signature attack, Glaive Rush, then finish it off on the next turn. With the Elite for eviscerated, we head up to face our toughest challenge yet, the champion Gita. We send Spriggy in first and Terastalize against her lead as Pathra, then proceed to one-shot this bird and her next Pokemon, Veluza. From here, she brings in her Avalug, and we don't really want to mess around with the grass type against this big icy boy, so we swap to Palafin, then instantly flip turn out to activate our zero to hero and bring in Iggy. Iggy tanks a body press, which takes out just slightly less than half of our health as we clap back with the hyper voice. Then all we can do is pray we don't get crit. I thought it would be not that close, but that's fine. Never punished, baby. Let's go. We finish the Iceman off on the next turn, then swap to Palafin to take out Gita's King Gambit with a four times effective close combat. From here, we bring in Revivroom to deal with her Go Goat with a couple poison jabs, then we swap to Danny the Dug Trio as she brings in her Ace Glamora, who terastalizes. This transformation basically does nothing other than make it look silly as it dies to a couple earthquakes. After our victory, the champion escorts us outside. Congratulations. I made you something. Whatever it is, I do not want it, Nimona. Okay. You want a battle? Ah, uh, what the heck? Sure. Later, though. Now that we've completed the Elite Four, we decide to make Nimona wait as we wrap up Starfall Street. In order to do this, we head up to our school where we find the director outside waiting for us. He claims to be the leader of Team Star, so we have no choice but to finish our mission and take him out. We start the battle off by sending in Spriggy against his Orange Guru, taking it out with a Night Slash into a U turn. This U turn allows us to bring in Palafin, then instantly swap to Randy the Rev of Room to take out his Obama Snow with a couple Iron Heads. Then we use a couple Flower Tricks from our cat to deal with his Gyarados. From here we bring in Palafin who liquidates his Houndoom and use Cryogonal to clean up his Poltergeist. You might not remember, but at the beginning of this playthrough, we chose Quaxley as our starter, which means that the director is rocking a Meowskarada as his ace. This thing is a super fast, absolute hitter of a Pokemon, so we do not mess around. We instantly swap to Rev of Room, Terastalize, live through a Thunder Punch, then take it out with a boosted Poison Jab. After the battle, the chairman tells us he actually isn't the team star leader Cassiopeia. Okay, Cool, but why did you say you were? Huh, no real reason. Okay. Confused but fired up, we head into the schoolyard to deal with the real Cassiopeia. <gasps> Penny? It was you all along? While I'm sure this major twist came as a surprise to everyone, what shouldn't be a surprise is that we easily roll through a team of evolutions with our nice spread of type coverage. With Penny defeated, it seems that the Team Star threat has been put to bed for at least the time being, which means we can head over to the lighthouse from the beginning of the game to meet up with Arvin at his dad's lab. Inside, we have a call with Professor Turo where he tells us that he needs us to meet him in the Great Crater in the middle of Paldea with the Violet Book. Sure, why not? But 
But before we're able to go help out Arvin's absentee father, the angst lord himself wants to battle. His team is pretty well rounded, so this turns out to be a tough matchup. We trade a couple flower tricks for a body slam against his greedent to take it out, then he brings in his scope villain. We swap to Palafin and instantly flip turn out of there to bring in Revavroom, who quad resists Scovillain's energy ball and cleans it up with the poison jab on the next turn. From here, we bring Palafin back in against Arvin's Garganackle, then use a couple liquidations to take it out. Next up, Arvin sends in his Toad Scroll, who easily goes down to a four times effective Ice Beam from Cryogonal. His second to last Pokemon is Cloyster, who has pretty abysmal special defense, so we're able to take it out with a few Ancient Powers. Then we bring in Palafin as Arvin brings in his final Pokemon, the Boss Diff, who comes in and instantly terastalizes. We terastalize right back, then hit it with the liquidation, which does way less than we were expecting. After taking a Terra boosted crunch to the dome, we're lower on HP than we would like to be, but we look at our team and don't really see any reasonable Pokemon to switch to, so we stay in and roll the dice with a close combat, which is thankfully able to take this dog out. All right, now we're actually in the home stretch. There's just one more battle before we can go rescue the professor. What better way to end our little battle spree than against the queen of congestion herself, Pneumonia. We follow the sound of heavy breathing into the center of Mesagoza and into battle. As always, her first Pokemon is Lycanroc. Knowing that, we lead with Palafin and flip turn out, taking out about half of its HP and activating our zero to hero. We bring in Revavroom who tanks a critical stone edge, then we instantly swap back to our Palafin in its bigger, badder form. It also gets crit by this dog's drill run, but not to worry though, we finish it off with the liquidation, then swap to Dugtrio to one-shot her next Pokemon, Palmot, with an Earthquake. From here, she brings in her Gudra, and we bring in Wigglytuff. What we sort of forgot about is that this dragon does have the Poison-type move Sludge Bomb, which lands and does massive damage, poisoning Wigglytuff on the first hit. To make matters even worse, our Play Rough misses on this same turn, meaning that we're forced to swap out to Revavroom, who's immune to Gudra's Sludge Bomb. We survive a Muddy Water and finally take this thing out with a couple Iron Heads. Next, we bring in Palafin as Nimona sends in her Earthquake. Worm. To avoid dropping our defenses, we resist the urge to hit this thing with the close combat, instead opting to terastalize and finish it with two liquidations. The same goes for our next Pokemon, Do Dunsparce. We keep our defenses high by using liquidation instead of close combat. The reason why we use all that willpower is because we know we need this Palafin to deal with her last Pokemon, Skeledurge. But it turns out that it wasn't even really a big deal. We're able to one-shot it with the liquidation before it can do any damage. Now that we've wrapped up all three storylines, we assemble our friends into the world's weirdest supergroup, then head into the crater to save Arvin's dad. We fight, fall, and finesse our way into the very bottom of the crater where we meet up with the professor. At least the person we thought was the professor. As it turns out, this isn't the professor. It's actually just some guy named Al Turo who keeps getting mistaken for the actual Turo. So mistaken, in fact, that he ended up locked in the bottom of this crater. We go deep into the heart of his prison where Al goes insane and lashes out at us. We have no choice but to defend ourselves, so we send out Dugtrio against his strange robotic Volcarona. A four times effective earthquake is more than enough to squash this robot bug. Next, he brings in his iron bundle to face off against our Revavroom. For some reason, this thing literally uses Snowscape three times in a row, so we're able to take it out for free. Then we use another four times effective earthquake from Dugtrio Trio to take out his Robo Tyranitar. Next on the chopping block is his Iron Jugulus, so we bring in Cryogonal, who outspeeds it with a super effective Ice Beam, but it's not quite enough to kill it, so we end up getting hit by a Flamethrower. Cryogonal don't care though, it just face tanks the flames like an absolute hoss, then finishes its foe with another Ice Beam. From here, we use a flip turn from Finizen to activate Zero to Hero and bring in Dugtrio against his Iron Hands. We trade a couple Earthquakes for Drain Punches, then since this is our last battle, we sacrifice Dugtrio to get a little little bit more damage, which makes this thing go down easier to Palafin. Finally, we have a showdown of the ages with our dolphin superhero versus Robo Gallade from the future. Imagine showing this battle to someone from Game Freak in 1995. They would be so confused. Anyway, Dolphin wins, which means that somehow we managed to surprise trade our way through Paldea and secure the W. Like the video and subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed it. Till next time.